Kamal, it's the day we've all been waiting for, me especially. Let's paint this town yellow <laughs> because it's Lib Dem Day. They've just launched their manifesto. And the big question is, how many seats could they win on July the 4th? We're also going to be speaking about Nigel Farage's Reform UK party and their plans for tax. Can he put some substance behind the sound bites? And moving on from UK into Europe, why has there been such a surge for a myriad of right wing parties? Welcome to The Daily Tea with me, Camilla Tomini. And me, Kamal Ahmed. This week, Camilla, it's going to be all about manifestos. Now, they sound slightly like homework, but Camilla, not for you and me. We, no, we realise they're actually oddly quite important. They lay out the prospectus for each of the parties about what they would do if they get into government. Now, of course, there's only going to be one of two parties in government on July the 5th, that's going to be either the Labour Party, most likely, or the Conservatives. But nevertheless, it is a reason for voting for those parties in many, many different seats. And today was the day for the Liberal Democrats. They're going to be there first this week. We're expecting the Conservatives tomorrow and then Labour slightly later in the week. And like the TV debates, they're a moment. Mm. Now, Maybe not many people will read every page of every policy um, uh, announcement that the parties want to make, but they are still an important engagement point for the parties. Because if we just, you know, do this political campaigning in headlines, then in the end, does the public really know what each of these parties are offering? So you went, Camilla, I did. on behalf of all the Daily Tea listeners and viewers. I did. I went to a very trendy sort of former factory turned into a very cool space called Lumiere, which is in Shoreditch. Don't normally go that far north. <laughs> Nearly got a nosebleed, Kamal. Um, it was very trendy. I mean, usually the Lib Dems announce things in not very trendy venues, so clearly they're going up in the world. I have in my hands, for a fair deal, the Manifesto 2024. Hold it up for everybody. Look at that. And um, can I just say, this is the new colour. You know the old yellow? That's gone out. Right. Everything was orange. Mm -hmm. It was like we'd been tangoed. Mm. Um, and basically, well, we're going to get into the substance of it in just a moment. But we had lots of Liberal Democrats in a big space. And then we all sat down and there was a little bit of tension building as we had the countdown to Sir Ed Davey. Three minutes to go. Could barely contain my excitement, let me tell you. And also, because of everything that he's been up to on the campaign trail so far, I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd been fired into the press conference by Cannon. But actually, he was on his feet. And to be fair to him, Kamal, and I know we said this last week, he gave a good speech, reading by autocue, but very natural, very down-to-earth, very human in his delivery. I will certainly give him that. And he was quite emotional again, following on from that video, where he spoke about caring for his late mother, but also his disabled son, John, who's 13. He spoke quite movingly about why he's put the NHS and social care at the heart of this manifesto. Should we have a listen? In the last 18 months or so, her pain was excruciating. She was confined to her bed, and caring for her became my life, before school and after school, giving her morphine for the pain, helping her on and off the toilet, sitting on her bed for hours, just talking to her, trying to make the most of every minute. And I was 15 when it finally took her, visiting her on a totally unsuitable dementia ward, in my school uniform when she died. It was a very moving way that he spoke. Just watching to it, you were actually there, but watching it was equally moving on television. NHS and social care, if you ask people what they most want to see solved by the government or the next government, it is those two issues. And actually, there's not been a huge amount of discussion about it. And it will be very interesting to see with the Conservative Party manifesto and the Labour Party manifesto, how much focus they will have on these two very, very interlinked issues. Of course, Theresa May in 2017 tried to put social care at the heart of the Conservative um, campaign, which obviously was so disastrous for her, announcing this new tax to pay for long-term care, which became known as the dementia tax. And I think since then... Both of the main parties 
have really been concerned about how do we really talk seriously about not just caring for older people, but caring in its totality. And the Lib Dems, now let's be straight here, because they're not going to be the next government, well, are, able to, are able to talk about it much more uh, clearly than maybe the other parties. Ed Davey walked on to Abba's Take a Chance on Me. So if enough people do, <laughs> you never know. He could end up in a coalition. You never know, Kamal. So I thought it was it was very interesting that they've gone there. And I think the public want that debate to be had. Yes. So let's keep an eye, Camilla, when, as we go through this week, which is a really, really big week in terms of policy proposals from the main parties, because we are only 24 days away from deciding who is going to be the next mm. government of the UK. But being there, once you'd moved on from NHS and social care... The big issues appear to me to be now buried on page 112, I yes. think, of the manifesto was we on. will we will over the long term, I think, mm -hmm. Camilla, what do they say there? Yeah, so basically... Um, <laughs> to the European the, Union, this is about the European, European Union. There's yes. sort of a lot of flim flam about closer relationships with Europe and talking about better trade deals. And obviously the journalists there, myself included, were trying to drill down into, come on, what are you saying that you want to rejoin the EU, and especially in light of the European elections that we're going to be coming on to in just a moment. So the, the line from the manifesto is as follows. Finally, once ties of trust and friendship have been renewed and the damage the Conservatives have caused to trade between the UK and EU has begun to be repaired, we would aim to place the UK-EU relationship on a more formal and stable footing by seeking to join the single market. So it's not full rejoin but it's very close alignment and rejoining at least the single market, Kamal. Uh, and would mean freedom of movement. And obviously, as you say, given the results in Europe um, for the European parliamentary elections over the weekend, what type of Europe that will be, I'm not sure it's going to be a very Lib Dem-flavoured European Union that they'll want to join. Because I think, well, we're going to get onto this, but there are some real big policy issues that Europe's going to have to deal with. But it is in the long term. As we said before on this podcast... People now, when it comes to Brexit, are not that engaged in that discussion. What was it? Over 70% of the last election thought Brexit was important when 2019, when Boris Johnson said, let's get Brexit done, became the, the key slogan of the Conservatives into that election. The number now is down around about 4% of people saying that it's important. Well, actually... Ed Davey was asked that actual question by Paul McNamara of Channel 4 News. You're the leader of a party that wants a closer relationship with Europe. Are you worried that you're fighting for further in integration with a Europe in which voters over the weekend have, have given a clear message that they want the opposite? Well, I, I, I don't know how you interpret the results. The way I would ultimately interpret it, the results is people across Europe and in this country are pretty unhappy. They want change. And we want change too, because we're unhappy. We think the Conservatives have made a mess of our economy, of our health service, and people want change. But in this country, people have got a party called the Liberal Democrats who've got some serious, sensible costs of policies that will bring that change. And in terms of getting a better relationship with Europe, whatever the make of the European Parliament, I think just, just makes sense. Just makes sense. You know, I've sp spoken to business people who say... They can't afford to export anymore because of the Conservatives trade deal. They've given up. How sad is that? It's undermined our growth. I've spoken to pharmacists who can't get the medicines that people in their community want because of problems with trade on pharmaceuticals. You know, I think it's pretty clear now that the Tories deal with Europe has been a disaster for our country. Uh, and so I, I, I'm a tough negotiator. Uh, and I would negotiate for our country for the best for our country, the best for our people. Um, but I know that what the Conservatives delivered is the worst for our people. I mean, I must admit, I did wince slightly at the I'm a tough negotiator of shades of Ed Miliband saying, am I tough? Hell yeah. However, <laughs> quite clever politics from Ed Davey because he stood on that stage and he said, I'm the only pro-European leader standing for election. Obviously, that will annoy Keir Starmer, but Keir Starmer's had to do full pivot away from his position <laughs> as shadow Brexit secretary for four years under Jeremy Corbyn and pretend he's perfectly happy with Brexit. Um, also, as is ever the case, the Liberal Democrats are quite good at kind of like 
giving a soft focus at the front of the manifesto where when you delve into the real detail, there are some quite punchy policies in here. The stuff on wealth taxes, for instance, raising capital gains tax for the wealthiest individuals and businesses. And um, buried in there somewhere, Kamal, is the idea that people who have a second home might see council tax rises of 500%. Some nice, I suppose, easy wins tickling their supporters' tummies over stuff that Liberal Democrat supporters, who are very clear Liberal Democrat supporters, really want to see pro-Europe pro more tax. After the election, dependent on how well the Liberal Democrats do, how well Reform UK do, and how many seats they therefore get, there could be quite a big debate about proportional representation yes. in the country. And you spoke to Daisy Cooper, the uh, deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats, about just that. Look, um, Liberal Democrats have um, supported proportional representation for decades and decades and decades. It's in our uh, manifesto and, quite frankly, I think any form of proportional representation uh, would be better than the system that we have. Um, quite frankly, I think you know, there's nothing that Nigel Farage stands for in terms of his values that I share, apart from perhaps this one issue. And all I would say is even a broken clock can be right twice a day. But So you would work with him, would you? Could you see Sir Ed working with him? No, I can't imagine working with Nigel Farage on this issue. If he wants to make the case of PR, he can do that, but we'll make our own case for it as well. So Daisy Cooper there saying that she wouldn't work with Nigel Farage, which doesn't <laughs> seem very Lib Demi and also not very proportional representation. The whole point of proportional representation is that you do have to compromise and speak to everyone who has been legitimately elected to Parliament. And Nigel Farage is likely to be one of those people. So quite an odd response there. Really odd. And also, I mean, a lot of the manifesto is quite reformian. Do we say that? Reformist? Do we say Faragean? <laughs> because, um, OK, they're borrowing heavily from New Labour, aren't they, when they're calling the manifesto, or indeed their sloganeering is Fair Deal, which is quite reminiscent of New Deal. But equally, listen to this, this could have been written by Nigel Farage, couldn't it, Kamal? In so many ways, things in our country are broken. The economy, the National Health Service, the climate, the housing market, all are in crisis after years of conservative neglect. So funny enough, these two parties that are pushing for PR have quite a lot in common, at least with their attitude towards the Conservatives and also their view that our political system is bust. Yes, and then after 14 years of Conservatives, how can you give them your vote uh, yet again? We're joined to discuss about just how well the Lib Dems may or may not do on July the 4th by Dom Penner, our political correspondent, regular guest on The Daily Tea. Welcome once again, Dom. Thank you. Where the polls are at the moment, how many seats could the Lib Dems win? And... Are they therefore more dangerous for the Conservatives than maybe some people think Reform UK is? So that is a point of commonality between the Lib Dems and Reform. They both pose what could be a fairly existential threat to the Tories at this election. The most recent YouGov seat-by-seat -seat poll showed the Lib Dems on course to win 48 seats, which is 37 more than they have after that disastrous campaign in 2019, despite Jo Swinson claiming she was ready to be Britain's next Prime Minister. <laughs> Since then, the Lib Dems have launched a real offensive in what they call the Blue Wall, made up of dozens of traditional Tory seats, targeting vo voters on sewage, on the NHS... And also this sense of moral disgust in many voters' minds with, for example, Partygate and the various sleaze scandals the Conservatives have had, that is something the Lib Dems have really sought to capitalise on. Rishi Sunak, of course, would say he's changed his party in the wake of all of that. Ed Davey kept on referencing the blue wall. No mention of any other walls. And actually, this is, I mean, the areas here that you're going to talk through some target seats very much around my neck of the woods. I think I've said this, but the only campaign poster I've seen so far is a giant orange Lib Dem one because mm. I live quite near to Chesham and Amersham where, mm. of course, they performed that by-election miracle last year and mm. managed to win that seat off the Tories after the incumbent, unfortunately, Cheryl Gillan passed away. So talk us through some of these targets then, Dom. So one of the most interesting and a real bellwether for just how much the Lib Dems could do on the night 
is Godalming and Ash. There was a lot of speculation this is a brand new constituency and it is made up mostly of Jeremy Hunt's old constituency so there was lots of speculation that Hunt might quit in order to avoid the potential embarrassment of losing his seat. To be fair to him, Jeremy Hunt will be standing which has really energised Lib Dem activists and it would need a swing of about 10% in order for the Lib Dems to win that particular seat. Hunt is absolutely confident that he will keep the seat. He's got quite a strong local profile there. He's, to all intents and purposes, been a solid constituency-focused MP, as well as his cabinet career. But the Lib Dems are really hoping that they can get what would amount to the Portillo moment of July the 4th if they were to unseat the Chancellor. And they're spending, he's spending a lot of time there, Camilla, because we're, we're hopeful of getting, you know, obviously a number of leaders and uh, very senior politicians onto the podcast, as we have been doing throughout the election campaign. And his team said, yes, yes, great. Could you come down and do a day's yes. campaign with him? We'll because be on the doorstep he's stuck, with him. He's, he's going to be down there a lot, actually banging the doors and making sure he gets the vote out. But geographically, this is interesting, isn't it, Dom? You know, London seats, OK, fine. The ones you might expect, Carshalton, Kingston, Richmond, is often going between the Tories and the Lib Dems. Twickenham, associated with former leader Vince Cable. You've got some seats in the east of England here. Seats in the southeast, where I'm from, which I just referred to. Lots of seats in the southwest that they're wanting to, to win. Pure blue wall country. There are a few in the north. Just talk us through... North Shropshire and indeed some of the northern ones, Harrogate and co. So these, again, despite being either in the Midlands like North Shropshire or in the north, Hazel Grove has been a Tory constituency for a very long time. It was Will Rag's seat before he resigned amid the controversy the other month. So they are seats that despite their location, they have more of a blue wall profile, whereas the sort of more traditional red wall seats which Reform UK and Labour are particularly focused on trying to win. The Lib Dems just aren't interested. That isn't their politics. That isn't their voter demographic. Instead, so many of these seats are in sort of the traditional southern Tory heartlands and where there are seats in the north, they tend to be even more affluent northern constituencies or more socially liberal and more white collar than blue collar northern constituencies which is why the Lib Dems feel able to take those on outside of their usual patch which like you say Camilla is those traditional Tory heartlands. Can we talk a little bit about Scotland as well which is going to be an actual very important part of this general election for Labour dependent on how much the SNP lose how many seats they may lose of the ones they have presently. Have Lib Dems got much uh, profile there? Are there some targets there that they could win? So at the moment, the Lib Dems only have two seats in Scotland, which I believe is not dissimilar to the number of giant pandas in Scotland. Um, (laughs) So just as rare, just as rare. But um, they are looking to gain free constituencies from the SNP, which again wouldn't make a massive difference to the Lib Dems overall electoral prospects. But combined with how well some polls suggest Labour could do in Scotland, that could turn a bad night for the SNP into a complete embarrassment if they're not only losing seats to Labour, and failing to pick up the Conservative seats in Scotland, but also losing out to the Liberal Democrats. Given that they're mostly fighting the Conservatives, as you, as you say, if you look through their list of their target seats, they're nearly mm-hmm. all Conservative target seats, and mm-hmm. that's where they're they're putting a lot of their resource. What type of voters do you think are going uh, to the Lib Dems? Is it is it that, I suppose you would imagine, one nation centrist taught conservatives who would find reform uk quite difficult leap for them to make exactly so these are voters who may well have voted lib dem in the past at some point um and now having once again put their trust in the conservatives they are inclined to go back after the last 14 years equally many of these um prospective Lib Dem votes, many of these votes being targeted, have voted Tory all their lives. Um, And as with many things, the Lib Dems have a couple of jolly names for their target voters. So there is Waitrose Woman, (laughs) who rather liked Boris Johnson, um, but has been put off through Partygate, through the sewage scandals, through the state of the NHS. And there are also the Surrey Shufflers, who are people who at one point may have voted Labour, moved to London in their 20s to advance their careers 
but now find themselves in their 30s or 40s in the home counties and struggling to get by perhaps as comfortably as they may have hoped. Can I just make a reflection on this desire to get Waitrose shoppers to vote for them? <laughs> when Nigel Farage came back from the jungle, he'd been on I'm a Celebrity, I saw him at an awards ceremony. He was quite well-oiled because he had been in the Australian outback and hadn't drank for some time. And he came up to me and said that he thought he'd really turned a corner because he was mobbed at Waitrose, <laughs> <laughs> whereas previously he'd only really been mobbed at Iceland. <laughs> Waitrose thought, woman could well break for reform. Can you imagine? I just think it's so funny how apparently the people who shop at Waitrose decide the next general election. I'm not sure that's quite true. Dom, you need to go back to the live blog, which I know you're manning this afternoon. Thanks so much for your wisdom and experience on this. Lovely Thank to you. see you. Thanks so much, Dom. Well, hopefully he recovered from being mobbed in Waitrose. <laughs> but Nigel Farage was on the campaign trail again this morning talking about those polls. And we spoke about this last week, Camilla. Could Reform UK get themselves into a position where they overtake um, the Conservative Party? Interesting point made. Although the Liberal Democrats are likely and will win many more seats than the Liberal uh, than Reform UK. Reform UK may get many more votes. Yes. Which will strengthen that whole argument around PR. Let's listen to Mr Farage and he was talking about the fact that he said they had momentum. If you take the YouGov poll of last week where we were prompted and we came out at 17%, if you take out London and you take out Scotland, you get a very interesting picture. We are ahead of the Conservatives in the North East right now. We are ahead of the Conservatives in the North West right now. We are ahead of the Conservatives in Yorkshire and the Humber right now. We're ahead of the Conservatives in the East Midlands right now. We're ahead of the Conservatives in the West Midlands right now. We're ahead of the Conservatives in terms of male voters. And we're ahead of the Conservatives in terms of Brexit voters. Yes, we're quite a long way behind in London. Yes, we're quite a long way behind in Scotland. But actually, in significant parts of the country, we are now the challenger to Labour. You know where else he's ahead? And there was this extraordinary story in the Sunday Times saying just how big Nigel Farage's social media following is. It's much, much, much bigger with much more reach than any of the other leaders. In fact, I think all of the other leaders combined. And just in terms of cut through, sometimes I do use my kids to sort of judge things. They were very familiar with Boris Johnson because he had become a meme and he'd been throwing basketballs over his head and there were so many videos, him on the zip wire and all the rest of it. Just interestingly, just to pick up from my children over dinner, you know, a lot of the kids are talking about this bloke and a lot of them are mm. exchanging videos and different things online. Um, my eldest works at a pub. She had mentioned that she had met him. Then a couple of other lads said, what, Nigel Farage, you're joking. Like, he has become this thing. He's become this political entity that manages to be talked about in every conversation about the election so far, it seems. And when you talk about momentum, that stuff can really matter. Every single election, you're not quite sure whether this momentum is actually just an uptick which will disappear or is it actually momentum to something really significant? Now, obviously, Nigel Farage is saying it is momentum to something really significant. So there's noise at the moment, as you say. What's the actual signal? And I think mm. that's what we need to be watching very carefully because they've made some announcements today, which we'll get into in a second. They've got their big economics announcements and policy announcements next week. Uh, he said, interesting, interestingly, they're not going to call it a manifesto because a manifesto is a lie. So they're going to call it, I don't know, series of policy announcements of some description. Action plan. Which we'll, get, which we'll get next Monday. Will their voters really sit down and consider um, their prospectus? They probably don't need to at this stage. The key for Nigel Farage, which is where the social media thing might be really significant, is just pile up as many votes as possible. Mm. If he wins two seats, five seats, that would be a huge moment in any case and get the conversation going. We've had Suella Braverman today saying that Nigel Farage would be welcome in a reformed uh, Conservative Party. Nigel Farage said there's no chance of that happening or any kind of pact happening before the election. He says that Conservatives are nowhere near where reform UK are. But nevertheless, there's still a side of the Conservative Party 
party represented maybe by Suella Braverman, who do believe the future of the right in the UK is a Farage-flavoured right. Mm, I mean, we're going to get onto this when we discuss the European elections, but the trouble is there's also just still something unsavoury about him. I mean, just over the weekend, we had Lee Anderson coming out basically suggesting that one of the reasons Rishi Sunak had this D-Day debacle is because he's not really a patriot, which is aping what Farage had also said. You know, I'm more patriotic than he is. Then we had Farage going a little bit further, didn't we, um, on Laura Koonsberg on Sunday, basically suggesting that one of the reasons why is because he's got immigrant parents. And I just think right-minded Conservatives in both sense of the word find that all just a bit uncomfortable. They can be really quite right-wing, by the way, economically, socially and all the rest of it. But I just don't think on one hand this whole barrow boy approach to politics really even does though, of appeal. course he isn't a barrow boy but yes <laughs> exactly this kind of yeah i'm the common man even though i went to dulwich college and was an, a banker and all the rest of it i get all that that kind of plain speaking does appeal to a great many people and let's be honest clarity of message is not a problem for farage but the other thing is you know you do have righty sort of thinking i'm going to have to hold my nose to vote for this guy that's As, the reality of it. Yes, this idea, of which is very fundamental to so many British voters, is this person sort of decent in some way. There's a sort of decency threshold that politicians have to get over, which I think, oddly, Ed Davey really leans into, although he's never practically, of course, going to be the Prime Minister. Is Nigel Farage making a judgment that he needs to have that clarity of message, he needs to lean into the negatives, and then after the next election, what type of Nigel Farage are we going to see? I wrote my column over the weekend, which got a huge amount of reaction, not all positive. Yeah, it, well, uh, it wasn't the headline something like, this is why Nigel Farage is wrong. <laughs> not wait, quite. Way to quite. ingratiate my, yourself. My point, my point was that if you are going to win from the right, you can be aggressive on certain policies, on immigration, on tax, on keeping your promises, on good public services. But you need to pitch your tent wider than your core uh, demographic, because if it's your core demographic, just as the left has found for many, many years when they lost election after election after election, if you just rely on your core demographic, you can never get over the line in the type of parliamentary system we have. So it'll be interesting to see whether Nigel Farage, Richard Tice, anyone in reform, just leaning into your point, do they start that journey now or do they run on this harsher messaging, which they've got at the moment, until election day, get some wins over the line and then push themselves maybe into a more big tentism um, uh, situation. And I think that's going to be a very interesting part of the political conversation over the next 24 days. You know, they've had a problem with their candidate selection process. Some candidates that seem to have said some very unsavoury things in the past about Hitler, about Tommy Robinson, about the world being overpopulated. You know, these people are in the ether and it's not quite clear whether reform are going to run with them as candidates or not. But it's almost this sense that, oh, well, if there are a few fruitcakes and loonies, to quote David Cameron, then it's just baked in. Can you just crunch some of the numbers on this suggestion that they've made today about raising the minimum tax threshold up to £20,000? Mm. Now, I actually think this is good politics. He's speaking so clearly. The country's skint. The use of the word skint, even. It's like common parlance. Everyone gets it. He also starts banging on about how much interest we're paying on our debt. I think the electorate sometimes confused between the difference between debt and deficit. When I say the electorate, I just mean me, Kamal. <laughs> um, but, it, but equally, you know, just to say we're paying money for nothing, that's a very clear message. Um, the idea of raising that VAT threshold from 90,000 to 150,000, that might incentivize small and medium-sized businesses to actually earn more money and employ more people. People wanted Jeremy Hunt to do that in the last budget. He didn't. He only raised the threshold by five grand, which seemed piffling. So all of this is very clear. This is very clear economic messaging. But you're looking at me sceptically like there's it a is, No, coming. no, no. C Camilla, it is very clear. And I think, I, you know, if anyone says to you, would you like to pay less tax for many, many voters? Yes. Yes, I would. Yes, please. I would, I would like to Only pay less tax. Only lefties like to pay more tax. But don't forget, don't forget, 
how damaging the magic money tree was for Jeremy Corbyn, that somehow he could have this idea of sweets for everyone and everything is going to be wonderful and we'll still be able to improve the NHS and we'll still be able to improve our schools and we'll still be able to do all these things um, and cut people's taxes. The public are smart. They know that you know, you have to make compromises. And if you want to spend on social care, then tax is going to be part of that. And I think there's been a very dishonest conversation about tax throughout this election. The Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives, Labour are all claiming they will not put up taxes on hardworking families. Taxes will increase for everybody over the next three years because thresholds and allowances are frozen. That's 11 billion pounds of new taxes that every individual will be paying because of um, uh, what the Conservatives have announced and neither Labour nor the Lib Dems have said they will reverse that. On this issue of the £20,000 new tax threshold, which is this huge leap from over £12,000 to £20,000, how do they pay for it? A relatively complicated new way of um, uh, returning back to the Exchequer some of the money that is paid at the moment to commercial banks for handling the way the Bank of England has financed what's called QE, the money we printed um, after the financial crisis to stop the economy going into deep, deep recession. You can make some changes there. Gordon Brown, former prime minister, obviously former leader of the Labour Party, he has said that if you change the way that that is um, looked at for tax purposes, you could raise some money. Now, Richard Tyson, Nigel Farage have said that could be £40 billion. Gordon Brown says maybe £1.5 billion. So, yes, I understand, Camilla, the clear politics of we're going to cut your taxes, but the public also know there has to be a mechanism for how do you pay then for the services that we want. And just saying it once in the way they said it this morning, I don't think we'll get the huge and significant movement that the that reform is trying to build. Well, not just elections in the UK ahead, but a huge number of elections across uh, the European Union over the weekend. They're for the European Parliament. Now, the European Parliament is one of the main institutions in the European Union. It's, it's where um, MEPs who are voted into the Parliament can vote on what the European Union is doing. And what has happened is in France, in Italy and in Germany, the right, and we're going to be careful, Camilla, here, aren't we? Too often, they are just described in a blanket term as the far right. But it's actually, there right. are many different types of right across Europe. There are much more moderate right. There are right that have started relatively extreme in some people's vocabulary, but have actually moderated much more quickly into uh, the middle. The most significant moment was probably uh, Marine Le Pen, um, who stands for the... Uh, National Rally part, Party in France. They got 32% of the vote. President Macron's Renaissance Party got only 15%. And Macron was so shocked by that event uh, and by the fact that uh, Marine Le Pen had done so well. He has now called a election in France. Now, just to be clear, he is the president until 2027. So this is the election for the French parliament. He obviously believes it's a gamble, but he believes that he's going to call the bluff, I suppose, of Le Pen and see if in an actual national referendum there is as much support for Marine Le Pen as there has been in these European um, elections. But the AFD in Germany, which is actually much more extreme right um, than Marine Le Pen's party, also did very, very well, as did the Brothers of Italy, um, Giorgia Maloney's party in Italy. Well, James Crisp, our Europe editor, joins us now from the European Parliament, which looks very glitzy and glamorous with lights on in the background, James. I mean, what do you put the weekend's results down to? Because obviously there's a lot of analysis, but maybe actually it's quite nuanced. Yeah, I mean, it is nuanced, uh, as you'd sort of expect across 27 member states. It's hard to sort of draw a massive pattern. But what we can say is that the hard right, if you like, have made big gains. But those gains haven't been so large that they can hold a majority in the European Parliament. Uh, the European Parliament works on a form of sort of coalitions, basically, of like-minded parties. And the centre-right European People's Party will be the largest group, and it will be able to get a majority by forming an alliance with the centre-left, 
uh, the Liberals, perhaps even Miss Maloney's uh, sort of soft Eurosceptic group, which means it can pass and amend EU law and effectively shut out the most extreme right-wing parties, like the AFD, uh, out of power, out of kind of a cordon sanitaire. But, you know, this is the third European elections that I've covered. In 2014, you'll all remember Nigel Farage's UKIP uh, won the British uh, vote. Marine Le Pen also won the French vote. Uh, you know, there was a real breakthrough for what was seen as these extreme right parties then. 2019, they consolidated those gains. And now there's been another step forward. So, look, the centre has held, but it's under pressure. And, you know, what will happen in 10 years' time? Because the longer that these parties are here, the more acceptable they become, the more they're part of the furniture, and they have an undoubted influence on the traditional establishment. We've already seen centre-right uh, European People's Party putting on many of the uh, more extreme fringes' clothes in terms of the opposition of, to net zero, uh, in terms of their much tougher migration policy. And I think the fact you know, we will see that influence continue to sort of be dragging the centre to the right. James, you just touched there on net zero and the policies. The Greens did not have, it appears from the numbers, to have had a good weekend. I mean, uh, what lessons are there in... There's quite an aggressive push, wasn't there, in many countries for new, um, what might be described as climate-friendly policies, this push to this net zero, as you say, which has been largely rejected by many, many voters. I mean, again, just to go back to the 2019 elections, the Greens posted their best ever results. It was off the back of the sort of mass climate uh, protest by Greta Thunberg. You know, it really seemed like this was going to be a green moment. Shortly afterwards, Ursula von der Leyen, the new, then the new commission president, came up with the net zero goal as one of her flagship policies. But things have changed. Uh, what's changed? It's been the cost of living crisis. The cost of living crisis, triggered by the war in Ukraine, has made people think that maybe these rules are just too expensive. And we saw, as a result, you know, the farmers' protests, the tractor protests across Europe, which paralyzed large parts of Europe, which led to big gains for farmers' parties and votes in uh, the Netherlands, which actually led Mrs. von der Leyen to shell legislation aimed at cutting agricultural emissions and the use of pesticides. Uh, you know, rather than anger this sort of this agricultural lobby, which, of course, the Greens say has been totally infected by the far right. And, James, how much is it a reaction to mass immigration? We know that that's been affecting the election here, but also, it seems, the elections across the European continent. Yeah, I think, I don't think you can really underestimate the sort of the, the psychological impact that the 2015 migrant crisis had on Europe. You know, we had millions of people sort of moving across uh, the continent in numbers not seen since the Second World War. And frankly, you know, that sort of thing makes people scared. It makes people... I mean, look, they've, since then, they've started to build what's called here Fortress Europe. You know, there's a lot of talk before the Brexit referendum about the EU being soft on migration. It isn't soft on migration. And again, we see with Georgia Maloney... Uh, but, you know, there's stuff being talked about now, offshore processing of migrants, kind of Rwanda-style deals, by traditional establishment parties. And that just wasn't the case a few years ago, but now it's mainstream. I mean, I think also, when you think about the AFD, the AFD, in the run-up to the election, you know, they had a string of scandals, a Chinese spying scandal. Their lead candidate in the European elections said in a press interview, but not all Vapen SS members were criminals. And they still beat Olaf Scholz. And perhaps the fact that, I don't know, a failed asylum seeker stabbed uh, a, a, a sort of a, a hard right blogger in Mannheim and a policeman was killed in that incident has also sort of weighed on German voters' minds. I think if you remember Angela Merkel, of course, she said, Wir schaffen das, we'll take it, we'll do it. You know, threw open Germany's borders and took in a million Syrians. Uh, but, you know, in, in some ways, that's sort of kind of inspiring. But there's also a price to be paid. And I think that in Germany and Europe as a whole, that price is still being paid in tension. Europe, Kamal, not always the stuff of Remainer's Tuscan dreams, is it? <laughs> not always. It'll be interesting to see 
What effect does that have? I've had lots of messages today saying, look what's happening in Europe. Mm. Therefore, what could happen here with Reform UK? So it is something that we will keep a very close eye on. Manifesto week continues. We'll be covering the Conservatives on Tuesday and Labour later in the week. So do please tune in tomorrow at 5pm.